My name is Glenn Lipka. I'm the VP of user experience at Marketo. It's a B2B uh, SaaS software company in Silicon Valley. Uh, I was the first person that they hired at Marketo, and we're up to about 220 people now. And I work with engineers every day. Uh, the role of a good UX designer is to partner with uh, engineers so that these, for the same amount of work, you can have a product that customers will love as opposed to one that they get frustrated with and start hitting uh, their screens. Um, I love this slide to talk about user experience and what exactly it is. The way that you do something, the way that you present the user interface, the way that you present a presentation, people have a reaction to it. It could be boring, it could be really interesting. If you do it the right way, people really enjoy the presentation. One of the things that I see a lot in presentations is people use bullet points, but it's a bad idea to do that. And the reason is you can't listen and read at the same time. Nobody can listen and read at the same time. You can switch back and forth quickly, but we're uh, single-threaded in this way. Now, what you can do is look at pictures and understand the pictures and also uh, listen at the same time. So as long as I'm talking, it's not a good idea for me to make you read too much. Pictures are always going to be the best thing. Um, this is just physiologically true. There's the same sort of patterns around user interface. If you put something in a place that people don't understand where it is, or if let's say you make instructions and they're jagged lines, it's going to have strain on the eye. They're going to have a hard time reading it. They might not read it at all. And that's not what you want. As engineers and as uh, product decision makers, you really want to make decisions that really could be equal amount of time but are going to yield a better result. All right, so the topic today is really about consistency, the user experience of how uh, consistency works, and specifically how using a framework, using a framework uh, like Wakanda can help you have a better uh, consistent experience for your customers. But consistency is actually a complex topic. There's this concept, um, don't move the cheese. Um, Facebook does this all the time. You get used to how Facebook is, then they change it, and what happens? Everybody freaks out. Um, this is just the way that people are. They're hardwired to not like it when things um, change and are different. Now, Facebook has taught us that people get over it. They do get used to it, and then they move on. But that backlash happens a lot. And I've seen in many cases of where that backlash can ruin a company because they don't get through it. I mean, where are you going to go if you don't like Facebook? There's, there's no place to go. However, if you don't like Windows, you know, if they make a change, you can go to Mac. You know, if there's real competition, then you know, that backlash can be serious. So this, uh, it comes from a story of um, an experiment. They had rats in a cage, uh, in a maze. They put a cheese in a particular spot. They kept going and finding the cheese, and eventually they moved the cheese. But the rats kept going to the old place to get the cheese and eventually starved to death. All right, the reason this works has to do with uh, dopamine in your brain. So there's a, a part of your brain that's really important, and what happens is every time something good happens, little bursts of dopamine, which is like you know, brain drugs, it makes you feel really good, the cells in this one area change shape and change reaction to whenever that pattern happens again, they deliver the dopamine. Whenever something negative happens, they stop. They turn off the faucet. So when um, somebody sees a pattern, something they've seen over and over again, dopamine automatically kick, kicks in. They just have a feeling that it's right, right? Sometimes it's very little, but that feeling that something is right is really important in user interface. And it really comes down to how this works. When you make a change, it's different. It doesn't matter whether or not it's better. The dopamine will stop, right? Until they get used to it again, they're going to have this feeling that it's different. Change is pretty serious. This is also, you say uh, an object at rest tends to stay at rest. We were. Um, at uh, Marketo, we're up to 220 people, which means we're moving offices a lot. You know, we're um, moving desks. And so I was in Photoshop moving names around, and all the different managers were trying to figure out where the new people are going to sit. The plan that we ended up with is everyone just stays where they are. Because, you know, it's just too much trouble to think about moving, because that's exactly what kicks in. So consistency keeps the dopamine going, keeps people feeling just pleasant about what's going on. So in a user interface, you might see that as like, I'm going to take just one example out of many. This is a screenshot at Marketo, a modal dialogue that has some complexity around it. Step one, step two, step three. Wizards are not always that simple. 
especially for users who don't know where it's going to go and what's going to happen. So it's really important that it always looks the same. It is always the same sort of buttons along the top. The forms are uh, organized the same way. Having that consistency is really important. If you think about how frameworks can be applied to that or how it could go wrong if everyone in an engineering group is just kind of making it up as they go along, having things very consistent is critically important. Now, I picked this one in particular because um, there was a customer who was looking at it saying something was wrong. And it gets into this concept called the uncanny valley. Uh, is everyone familiar with this? Or who here knows about this? It basically is if things are really, really close to being accurate but not accurate, it actually is much worse than if it wasn't even close. Um, and so it's terribly important if I go back one. Oops. Sorry. There was supposed to be a close button right here. And I, I just watched people struggle with that. And like, how do I close this again? Or if I click cancel in step two, does that cause a problem? And it's these little touches that are important. So one of the things that I did was I went back to, with the engineer saying, how did this modal become different than another modal? And they had subclassed in two different ways, um, one of which had some definition, another which had a different definition. And that engineers were just left to their own devices of which one of these to choose when they were making any random modal. So if you just walked throughout the app, there would be a hodgepodge. Now, we're pretty strict about using these patterns. But most of the companies that I've worked at, every engineer just made their own subclass of a modal. And every single one looked a little different than the other one. And this just causes a lot of grief uh, for users. And that consistency weighs on them. Now, part of that is making a choice between two things that are both right. In a Mac, the go forward button is on the right. And in Windows, the go forward button is on the left. Now, which do you choose? Because you might be saying, well, the, our users are 90% Windows users, as most are. Therefore, we should use the one on the right. But Apple makes a pretty good case that going forward is more to the right and that we should do going to the right. And which which one do we want to move the cheese for and, and making that choice? And the answer is it doesn't matter. You pick one and stick with one in your application. Most people do not think of Windows and Facebook or the intranet application as related in any way. It doesn't matter how something works in your application versus Facebook or versus Windows. You don't have to worry about how um, that is going to be. But within your own application, if there's one place that it does one thing and another place where it does another thing, that's going to screw everybody up. So you want to have consistency in what you do, write down these patterns ideally, bake them into the classes when you instantiate a modal or um, however the forms are working in your system, and make sure that an engineer can't, by accident, do it the opposite way. There's a, a grid that I use to help me figure out when to move the cheese or when not to. So on the y-axis is you have some design or a way of doing it that's perfect for this situation. And then at the bottom, you have patterns that you've used in the past that are consistent. So let's imagine you have something perfect for the situation against something that is terrible for the situation, and they're both equally inconsistent. Well, obviously, you should do A. I mean, there's no benefit of doing B. It's the same consistency. Let's imagine you were doing A against D. So if something is really, really perfect, and the other one is just really, really consistent, but it's a terrible for the situation. This is where you're trying to put a round peg into a square hole. It's not really working in the application. In this case, you should have a ritual, make a new pattern, document it of how A is going to work, make it part of the, of the system, make it part of the family, but make it difficult to do. So you can't like just invent A's all the time. It really has to be a situation of where everything else in the system is just awful for that situation. The hardest one to do is A versus E, the one in the middle. A is great. It's just inconsistent. And E is pretty consistent, and it's pretty good. But it's not like A is that much better. It's just better. And it's, E is consistent, but it's not the ultimate of consistency. This is where it's on the bubble, and you have to make a decision. Generally, I would say always go with E. Consistency trumps uh, better for the situation. 
because you might have this perfect UI, but every single perfect UI that you've got, the user's got to learn that. And it's easier to just tell them, look, it works the way this other thing works. In Marketo, for example, everything that you want to add to the main canvas area is from the right. It doesn't matter if it kind of looks better if it's on the left or on the bottom or on the top. It's always on the right. So when I'm training people, I just say, anything that you drag is always going to be on the right. And it's never going to change. And that way, they just lock that away as a pattern that they don't have to think about. And everything is consistent. And they can just move on. If I said, well, this one, it looks better and it's on the top. Now I've got to remember, OK, in this circumstance, it's coming off the top. In this circumstance, it's coming off the right. There is no point of teaching them how to do things in different ways um, just because it's a little better in one circumstance. Better to keep things simple. Marketo is a fairly complex application. There's a lot going on. Unless you're doing an application that is so simple and there's like nothing to do, but then you generally won't run into these troubles. But all applications grow. They all get more features. They all get more things going on. You're going to have to make these decisions not up front. You make them over time. Like in the beginning, you think about, well, what are all the things that we're going to need? And then six months later, you're like, oh, we didn't think about that. We don't, we don't have anything that will cover that. And the temptation is to just jump to A, just make something new to do that. And it's really important to do your best to try to get the more consistent patterns in place. Now, there's some benefits of being different. Um, Apple had that great campaign about think different, um, not think differently. Think about how can we be different. This is not within your application, but compared to other applications. So who here has competition? Surprisingly, only that side of the room. <laughs> All right. Um, Whenever there is competition, whether it's do nothing or use a competitor, it is critical that someone is able to differentiate what you do versus what the competition does. Um, there's a, uh, an article that just a blog post called uh, Minimum Viable Personality. And it's talking about how the personality of your application creates loyalty. And that if you're the same as everyone else, you're a zebra in the middle of a bunch of other zebras, at that point, it's whoever's cheapest. And then they'll go with that. If you really want to stand out, if you want to maintain loyalty, you have to have some personality. You have to have it be a little bit different. I'll give you an example of that. This should be familiar to everyone. It's an iPod, right? OK, so here's the interface up here. So if I want to go to the right, I press in the middle. right? So right equals middle. Then when I'm on that next screen, if I want to go back to the left, I go up. And then if I want to go down on this list, I go in a circle. There is no person in the world who would have said, that's the way to do it. Like, <laughs> when I first got an iPod, I was like, what the hell? You know, I had no idea. But then you know, a few minutes later, you, it, you bake it into your memory, and then it works. Now, this has personality. Everything else worked very literally. You know, if you use the um, Creative Zen, or there was a bunch of different iPod players before the iPod, uh, MP3 players before the iPod, and they all were more literal. And so they took a different approach. It wasn't that it was intuitive. It's not intuitive. There's nothing intuitive about it. But it was kind of fun. You know, it had some personality. And it was easy to, once you learned it, to just repeat it. It didn't constantly make you think, I keep forgetting this, because it just became second nature. It, this is an important lesson. It's not that you have to have everything be intuitive or perfect. It's that you have to have it differentiated from other people and easy enough to get used to and do repeatedly. So if you're going to go into a situation and say, OK, well, I'm going to reinvent this. You know, they, I know Facebook works a certain way, and I'm going to do it differently. Or I know that the competition works a certain way, I'm going to do it differently. You got to make sure to do it in a way that adds personality and is better. So for instance, somebody reinvented the wheel. I don't know if you guys have seen this. this is, I saw a video about this. It's fascinating. It doesn't get flat tires. Um, it, it, they, it lasts for a long time and gets better gas mileage than a regular tire. They reinvented what a wheel on a car looks like. And these are just rubber things that bend. Um, they did it better, and it has personality. 
I don't think you could buy this because of lobbyists are shutting down the whole thing, but um, <laughs> they did a good job of reinventing the wheel. And in any application, if you do a good job with it and it has some personality, you'll reap the benefits. If you do a bad job, then you know, it's not as good. <laughs> um, it's very important to, when you're designing this, it's not just always looking for what's the perfect answer or what's what everyone is used to or you, you got to think, I need to be outside the pack. I need to be differentiated. There's a book by Seth Godin uh, called Purple Cow. Um, and he talks about you're driving and you see a brown cow and you say, oh, kids, brown cow. You pass a purple cow, you got to stop the car, get out and take a picture because nobody's seen a purple cow. And if you have that personality, that difference, people will stop and take notice. It is a very competitive world out there. Even if you're doing just internal applications, everyone is just comparing what you're doing you know, with anything else that they use. And people want to be inspired. They want to have something interesting in their lives. Even if it is purely like a data management application for a hospital, which I've met a couple of people and there's several hospital, uh, how many people here work in the healthcare hospital area? Not that many, I was, I was thinking that maybe everyone would raise their hands. Anyway, <laughs> um, it doesn't matter who they are, that they still want to be inspired by the applications they use. They still want it to be interesting. Somebody once told me that, oh, B2B has got to be really like, you know, blue, white, black, simple, like very staid, can't have anything interest. And I told them, have you ever been to uh, Las Vegas where they have a convention, right? Who is the drunkest, loudest people? The corporate, the people coming from a corporation in Vegas for a conference. They are partying like you wouldn't believe because they can't do that at work. This is their chance to like let off some steam. And these people, like, they have lives and personality, and they don't want their applications to be boring. They want their applications to have some life. It's a way to just free yourselves of thinking you could do it this way, especially if it's a web application. I mean, you're not tied down to like what Visual Basic can give you. You can design it any way you want. CSS can look however you want. So it's important to think that these people really don't want you to be as conservative as everyone makes it sound. People are horrible judges of their own desires. Uh, there's a story of um, Sony did a, a, a focus group. So you had a bunch of people in the room. They showed them yellow boom boxes and black boom boxes and um, Walkman and all that. And they said, which do you think people will like more, the yellow ones or the black ones? And overwhelmingly, everyone said the yellow ones. And then they said, thank you. If you all go out, out, out on the tables, there's some uh, equipment. You can take whatever you want you know, as a gift from us. So everyone went out and there was yellow and black uh, equipment and everyone took the black ones. <laughs> you know, like people can't, it's a different part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex. And it could fool you, it could think too much. It could think that what people mean is what they say. Um, I don't have this slide here, but when you think about your uh, customers and your users, think about them like Diane Fossey when she um, looked at the gorillas. She didn't ask them, what does the silver on your back mean? Because the gorillas gave her terrible answers when she tried. She just watched. She observed. She learned by looking. That's what you should do with users. Never ask them questions. They're, they're not better than gorillas. They will not tell you what they like and be honest. They won't tell you what they don't like and be honest. They'll spend 10 minutes talking about something they really don't even care about. I listen to people talk nonstop about this feature. We built the feature. Nobody uses it. They just wanted it to be there because they thought they needed it to be there. Right? So you really have to think about what people need by watching them and observing them, not just by um, listening to them. All right, so let's get into some frameworks here. OK, this, this used to be standard practice. There was on-click equals, style equals. If you'd look at any particular application, it would all be in line. What this led to was a completely unmaintainable code base. Nobody could come to somebody else's code and figure anything out at all. Um, we have this uh, uh, method of figuring out, well, that looks weird. Let's try that again. Wow. <laughs> Wonder why that's doing that. Yeah, no. Let me try to fix it. Oh, 
was, no better. There we go. Okay, this is our code review process. This is a measurement of quality. It actually works for movies, comedians, it works for uh, television shows. It's really, it's really good. What the fuck's per minute? So good code, they're very low, right? Bad code, it kind of happens a lot. Um, and so we were looking at that code and just constantly just, you know, looking at it saying, I, we don't know what to do. We don't know if we take it out, something would go wrong. We ended up calling it Jenga code, right? Jenga code is, You take one piece out, you know, one function that you think, oh, nobody will need this. You know, like, or I'm going to refactor this code and it'll be fine. And then the whole thing falls apart. And that we end up with these huge lists of, uh, you know, functions that are nested or switch cases and nobody can know what to do with it. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And there was one piece of code that we had that had a to do right at the top saying this shit needs to be refactored. Right? And then it was the longest piece of code that you've ever seen. And the problem with Jenga code is that it comes from that inline style. This is the, the dream that frameworks deliver. You don't have to do that kind of code. We use um, a framework, but somebody had actually put in on click equals whatever. They, they were new to the company. They hadn't been through like uh, the architectural reviews, but they just knew how to make something work in JavaScript, so they kind of shoved in on click equals something. I saw some style equals something, and it freaked me out because I knew that nobody would ever be able to maintain that in the future. As a designer, I depend on the engineers to be able to deliver features. If they, like once you get customers, your productivity curve goes lower and lower and lower because there's escalations, there's bug fixes, the, all kinds of stuff about scalability that has to be done. And sometimes you cut corners, but I know that like, if everything is in a framework and everything is consistent, I can get a new feature quickly. And it's happened a lot. Sometimes we've refactored code, cleaned up the Jenga code, made it more standardized, used the framework, and then for the next six months, every feature I wanted was really quick and easy. If you don't, if you kind of let that get out of control, you end up not delivering features and everything becomes really difficult. One of the problems also when you grow is the lines of communication get so complicated. So how can you have consistency amongst four people or eight people or 12 people? I mean, how many, how many people here have more than four people that they work with uh, on code base? It's most of you. I mean, the lines of communication get pretty big. I work with 30 engineers. It's, in, it's unbelievable. All kinds of crap code can get passed. And that the more you use the framework, the more that you standardize on don't break these rules. I mean, if you have a compiled app, you can have like the siren go off uh, that says, oh, somebody broke the build. But if you don't, you know, a lot of times you just have to make it part of the culture because you can't have code review every single day on every line of code. You need to make it part of the culture that don't invent new things. Don't make new ways of doing things. Use the framework. Because every time somebody invents something new, it's something that a user is going to have to learn and then another engineer is going to have to maintain who didn't know what the hell you were talking about when you started it. What's weird is within the large organizations, you get somebody who thinks that they know what's going on, and then a new person is saying, oh, you show me what to do, and it's just the blind leading the blind. And they just make things even worse, because then they're embedding a culture of doing something the wrong way. It's not just some one-off thing. Now all of a sudden, like an architect gets involved saying, why are you teaching him to do this in this wrong way? This happens all the time. And what ends up happening is you don't make sales. I mean, it's a direct line between having a good application and somebody buying the application and then referring it to somebody else. Referrals are huge. People don't refer applications that are just adequate. They refer applications that make them feel good, that have the dopamine going. And then if you have an application of where things are just going awry, this shouldn't be that um, strange to you guys. I mean, I'm sure that you've experienced these things of where somebody was teaching you to do something and then you found out later that was the exact wrong thing to do. Features flow from clean code. Frameworks help you deliver clean code. 
That's why to have frameworks. That's why frameworks are probably the most popular things that, um, that come out and that simplify the lives of developers. And that the point of it is to have features. The point of it is to have a product that somebody can use to get their job done. We're not just coding just for fun, we're coding for some purpose. And that the cleaner you keep that code, the better. Okay, so summary, there's some irony in here, by the way. Consistency within the app is good, but different from the competition is good. Maintainable, clean code is good, and bullet points are bad. <laughs> All right, just a little irony. All right, so we have a few minutes left, five minutes, I think. Um, so we can open it up to questions. Don't be shy. Stumbling, have I read Dan Gilbert's Stumbling on Happiness? Um, I've read Tony uh, Shea's Delivering Happiness. Um, Harvard psychologist talking about people don't know what they want. Yeah, there's a, a book on um, how we decide and the art of choosing that are, are similar. Half of what I do is cognitive psychology. I mean, there's cause, cause and effect. I mean, this is a relatively short uh, presentation, just mainly about consistency. But there's all kinds of things around uh, user experience that are just cause and effect. If you have icons, for example, people like them, right? I mean, it's, it's just one of those things. They just make people happier than if you don't have icons. And there's plenty of applications that don't. But it's, it's when you're watching how people react to things, um, you can make an application for the exact same effort that is much better. But it's all about psychology. It's all about how people think. Like for instance, the human eye, it works like a bird's head. If you ever see a bird's head, it does not move like this, you know, like nice and smooth. It goes bam, bam, right? It's just from one shot to the other, and your eye works that way too. If you ever seen somebody, so let's say uh, you're in a train, you're facing them, they're facing you, and behind your back is the window, right? And they're looking past you out at the window, and you can watch their eyes just freak out, go back and forth. They don't even realize it's happening because they're looking at like a tree go by and then another tree go by and then another tree go by and their eyes are whipping back and forth. And our eyes are just designed not to move slowly. Our heads are slow, but not our eyes. Which means that if you have text and on the left, like let's say you center the text. So as you're reading it, you have to find a new spot on the left because it's all a different width. That the left side is called jagged. And it actually puts a tremendous amount of eye strain and people will read centered text half as effectively as they read left justified text, right? And these are things that nobody can control. It's just part of our brains and part of our physiology. But why would you center text? Like if you know it's gonna be difficult to read. Some people are colorblind. Why would you have uh, the colors be not contrasting? You know, it doesn't make any sense. Even if you just had white text on black background versus black text on white background, it causes some eye strain. And there's no, there's no difference. I mean, it's a, it's a setting. trends in web design or web application design that you think are particularly egregious or good for that matter? Um, things that I think are good are movement to more what I'll call a web top application. It's like half desktop, half web page. So if you look at um, salesforce.com or something like that, it's, it's a big long form and you click next and then it's a big long form and you click next. And those sort of applications, which are like shopping cart type applications, they're kind of old school, whereas having something richer, um, using Ajax more, having it so it looks a little bit more like an application where you can have toolbars and you can have um, the uh, panels on the side. I think the, uh, the Wakanda client lets you do a lot of that kind of stuff. Um, I think that's really good. It's opening up the door to a much richer application. Things that are bad, um, there's a bunch of people who believe in you build one way to do something in an application. Like if you want to print, okay, the only way to print is to click this print button. Whereas in Windows, I can drag something and drop it on the printer. I can press Control P. I can click the printer icon. There's a menu thing to do print. There's all these different ways of doing everything. And what happens is people will guess and whatever they guess is either gonna be right or wrong, right? If it's wrong, they may have to guess up to five times before they understand your way of doing things. I call this uh, spoon bending. You know, if you see in the Matrix, he's talking to the little kid, and he says, how do you bend the spoon? And he says, well, it's not that hard. 
when you realize there is no spoon and then I'm only bending myself. And I think of the spoon as the right way to do a particular function in your application. And if you just stop trying to make the user do it exactly the way you want it to be done and let however they guess be the right way, people will just say the application's really intuitive. It's like it's reading my mind when really you're just stacking all of the uh, cards in your favor. Um, there's a lot of applications that are um, going towards that one direction. I think they're giving me the uh, signal. So if you've got any other questions, I'm happy to help uh, after. But uh, I hope you learned something today. Thank you.